Good afternoon, PGBS. Uh, good to see all of you for our executive speaker series. Um, we have the honor of welcoming uh, to our uh, noon session, Dr. David Feinberg, an alum of ours, an MBA and also PKE, who is the head of Google Health. So uh, it's uh, such an honor to have him speak to us and to our students right now. So today, how we're going to do this is we're going to collect, I'm going to be collecting the Q&A and saving most of the questions till the end of our discussion. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm gonna allow Dr. David uh, Feinberg to start our discussion today, talk about his background and his transition to Google Health. Um, and he'll be speaking to us and then uh, we'll cover some of the other topics. So that's all welcome, David. And David, you have the mic. Well, thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here. I wish we were in person, but I, I have a feeling we're still a, a number of months away from those kinds of meetings. So we'll try to make this as uh, informal and intimate as if we were all in the same room. Um, you know, Abraham, you asked me to kind of start with my background uh, and the transitions. In some ways, I feel like I haven't made any progress or any transition. I'm still working on the same things that um, drove me from the beginning. So I'm trained as a child psychiatrist and uh, actually was during my early years as a faculty member at um, UCLA in child and adolescent psychiatry that I went to Pepperdine for my MBA. And I thought that if I got an MBA, and back then there weren't a lot of doctors getting MBAs, um, now they have combined programs and stuff like that. The I thought that um, uh, somebody would find me and I would um, be plucked out of UCLA into some dream job. Actually, what I learned at Pepperdine, uh, two really important things. One, I learned, and people laugh when I say this, like I learned how to use Excel. Like, so I learned the tools of business. And the other thing I learned was to be present and that I was actually in my dream job as a young faculty member at UCLA. I just didn't know it. And Pepperdine taught me that. And there were a couple cases back then that I'm still working on. One was a 12-year-old uh, boy who um, had got transferred to UCLA from Las Vegas. He was um, uh, an only child of a single dad. Mom had left. And dad was a car salesman. He actually sold Cadillacs, used Cadillacs in Vegas. So just think of the kind of person that would fit that kind of stereotypic role. And this 12 year old had a new onset psychotic disorder, um, turned out to be schizophrenia. And I'm giving the feedback to the dad. I'm new in my, I was actually just finishing my training in child psychiatry and I'm telling the dad, I'm really demonstrating how smart I am and how little the dad knows. Because I'm talking about things like neurotransmitters and reuptake and nucleus accumbens. I'm talking medical. And the dad stops me and he says, are you telling me that I need to build a room out back? Mm -hmm. And when he said it, um, I actually started crying. I, I, my wife and I had just had our first child. She was about a year old right then. She's 28 now. So I guess this story is about 27 years old. And this guy taught me that you got to talk to people in a way they understand that when bad things happen in healthcare, it changes the trajectory of an entire family. And um, I've been working really hard on that case for the last 27 years. You know, how can we get information to people in a way they understand? How can we connect to people and answer their real questions? And then another case that happened a few years later that I think fits that same thing that I've been working on is there was a, a third grade girl who wrote in her haiku poem that she wanted to tie yarn around her neck and kill herself. And now I'm already a faculty member and when this family learned about that through the teacher and the principal and this whole story, they knew people, they were connected. So they were able to get in to see me within three weeks. They kind of skipped the line. And I was like, whoa, 
your kid, your eight-year-old is suicidal and you know somebody and it still takes you three weeks to get in. Like, why isn't anybody, those who know people and those who don't know people, when they have something bad like this happening, why aren't they being seen today? So I've been working on that too. And I, and, and I worked on that for, tw for 25 years at UCLA. I had a great uh, and have great institutional loyalty to UCLA um, in working on same day access, uh, improving patient satisfaction. I mean, it was always around those same things around communication and coordination. I then went to Geisinger, I guess this is now about six years ago because I was at Geisinger for four years. And to me, it was an opportunity to take care even a take care in a deeper way of a population. So Geisinger, for those who aren't familiar, and most people out here are familiar with Kaiser, it's like a Kaiser where there's an insurance product and a clinical product. So you, in essence, don't have any bad incentives. You, you have incentives to actually keep people healthier. And um, uh, that was an amazing ability to understand what it's like to love a community. It's, it's a community of people that don't move. It's, there's not a lot of in or out migration. They've grown up with this institution and it was great. And then when Google called, it was the, the thing in my mind was, um, wow, Google talks at a world scale. Could we, could we at Google do what I tried to do for those two patients? Could we explain things in a way that are understandable? Could we get that information out to people? And could we make it really accessible that you don't have to wait, that we could get you that answer at home or whatever? So um, that's what got me excited. Uh, now I've been at Google coming up on two years, um, but I, 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 um, I'm still working on those two cases. Awesome. So can you tell us a little bit about where Google fits in, in the health arena? I know that they had their first run, which they closed the project uh, earlier on in the 2000 and 2012. And what motivated them to contact you and, and restart this probably, you know, with a different direction, different possibilities of helping the population. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and what convinced you of, of doing this would really help of the, as you said, a larger audience. Yeah, so um, if you really look at technology and healthcare, there have been a lot of false starts. And I'd say there have been some moderate successes. And I actually can come up with one, uh, what I would say, overwhelming success. So let me kind of go through them. So yes, Google, Microsoft, and others have tried to say specifically we're working in health, and it's not been successful. These large electronic health record companies um, with a lot of, in our country, federal funding um, have been, I think, successful in that they've taken records that used to be digitized when I started at those days, early days at UCLA. We had these contracts with this company called Iron Mountain that would store charts. And when a patient was coming next week, they bring, you know, six out of six vanilla charts, the vanilla folders with rubber band, you know, chart four of six, and there's a stack of papers or a new admission. And sometimes, you know, there would be four or six, but but two of the charts were missing. So we got records digitized. That's really a positive. Um, they're not easy to use and they don't necessarily talk. There's some problems still with them. So I kind of put them in the moderate. And then are there any real examples of technology coming into healthcare and fundamentally changing something? And I would say there is an example and it's not Google Health. It's Google. Um, 30 years ago, when I started as a doc, for the first 10 years without Google, the relationship between me and my patients was incredibly paternalistic. In essence, I knew or how knew how to get the information that they couldn't get access to. When you got a new diagnosis or a new medication, not a lot of people went to the library. Um, you went to your doctor and your doctor had this information. 
And then Google comes onto the scene, Google search, and has fundamentally changed it now. And in the beginning, I think there were problems with sometimes it would lead you down a rabbit hole and you had a headache and it was just a headache, but now you thought you had a brain tumor. I think we've got it much better, but fundamentally it has changed the relationship such that um, it's kind of leveled the playing field. It's, it's been a fundamental change. So that, that to me is an example of technology um, actually making a change. But your question was, why did Google Health or Google Health decide to do it again? Um, there were a lot of people at Google. I would say everybody at Google is super smart. There are a lot of people at Google that are super smart and working, were working on health related issues. There was a team under Google Brain, which was using AI or machine learning to improve diagnostic accuracy, particularly around computer vision. Uh, that same team was working on understanding the complex and trying to organize electronic health records. There was a team that became part of Google through an acquisition. Google bought a AI company in London called DeepMind um, that had a division that was working on healthcare uh, and had really some pretty significant successes with the national health system. Um, in uh, the UK. And there was, again, through an acquisition, Google bought Nest, the thermostat company. And that team was working on um, some products to keep people healthier at home. And this was before I got there, but those three teams, I think, uh, oftentimes weren't coming up with a coherent strategy about healthcare. And there was an idea well, what if we put those and some others together and try this health thing again? Um, and that's when uh, I was fortunate enough to be uh, called and said, would you consider taking a look at this and we're putting these things together? And that happened about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and that and a couple of other moves um, have created this opportunity for Google to say, we're serious about healthcare. Here's how we're gonna approach it. Uh, and then there's still other parts of Google that are engaged in health. But I think from a business standpoint, it makes it easier for customers to not have to deal with too many parts of Google um, that may be knocking at the door saying we're, we're trying to help out. So that, that's kind of how it happened. Um, uh, and it's been great. It's been a, a really fascinating culture for me to join. Um, and uh, I'm really, really proud of the work the team's already done. Um, I think, to improve health. Um, COVID, in a lot of ways, really helped us because it was pretty um, thoughtful that Google had got organized and then COVID happened, obviously terrible, but COVID happened and we had a structure to try to make impact and, and help a lot of people. Right. Great, wonderful. Um, you mentioned a couple of points about your MBA education, which was Excel, and on the other one was uh, being present. Maybe we'll spend a few minutes asking you about um, this overlap between business and health and your, your experience at Pepperdine and uh, particular your leadership, essentially. So moving from an academic setting to medical setting to a, a Google setting, uh, in terms of your leadership, maybe growth challenges and your perspective on that transition. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that to our business students, right? And the mindset perhaps um, that our students could, could learn from that, that type of uh, learning and experience from you. Yeah, the, um, um, and again, I'd go back to Pepperdine on this one. Um, I, I, I'd say that uh, <clears throat> my son teases me that the only books I read are books that have bullets in them. Like I like books with like, you know, how to kind of stuff and always leadership or healthcare. Um, I'm not much of a reader of novels. So the, um, for me, from a leadership standpoint, uh, it really starts with personal values and the values that um, are important to me, that I work on every day, that I want those that are part of my team and surround me to embody, um, boil down to three. And I actually say them to myself 
every day. I used to say them when I would lock my car and you press the button on your key and you hear the beep. That was my reminder to say these three words. Now in this work from home environment, I say it kind of as I enter wherever my workspace is. Uh, but that beeper was actually a better reminder. And the three words that I say to myself are uh, passion, um, humility, and integrity. And I'm not great at any of them, but I'm working on them. And the passion is maybe you could compare this to religion or spirituality for some people, but I don't know that there's anything more important than health. And everybody wants to be able to live their life and have health or bad health not get in the way, or if they are suffering from some health issues to get back to life, right? It's, it's this fundamental thing, I, 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 I would say, that that that's an amazing privilege to work in that quote unquote industry. Um, and there's so much work to do. We know that um, health is not equitable, that health is not accessible, that health is not high quality, that a lot of people are suffering. And that's where <clears throat> the passion comes we got to get this one right. The um, humility for me is um, is almost the flip side to the passion. That if we get it wrong in healthcare, it's different than if you get it wrong in I don't know, pick an industry, banking or whatever, real estate or something, or entertainment. When we get it wrong in healthcare, people die. I mean, there are so many mistakes in healthcare that cost people their life or their limb. And we have to respect it with that kind of humility. You could say, you know, the kind of concept of do no harm, that we got to be really, really careful. And then the integrity one to me, and sometimes I think maybe that's the wrong word. Maybe a better word is trust. But the integrity one is, um, personally for me, is yes, don't cheat on your expense account. But it, it really means I've been blessed to be at, um, to have the opportunity and the privilege to be at some pretty top brand name places. UCLA, Geisinger, Google. These are brands that, have um, world, especially UCLA, I think there's 53 stores that are licensed that sell UCLA merchandise in China, but probably a lot more people in China think UCLA is a clothing brand. So these brands, Google, like what a privilege to be at one of these places. I don't wanna screw it up. I wanna leave it better than I found it. That's the integrity piece. Um, because those brands to me are so powerful and give you this great platform and opportunity. Um, but it, it fundamentally is about trust. Do people trust me? Do people trust in this case products and services? Without that trust, nothing gets done. And so that integrity trust is, is incredibly important to me. Those are the leadership um, tenets that that I, I literally think about every day um, and uh, work really hard to live up to. Thank you so much for sharing those. I think um, one of the questions that I might ask on top of that would be, you know, obviously you as an individual clearly have these values. Would you say that Google Health or Google shares in similar similar values uh, i think the maybe some of the I, I know facebook is doing health and as well as apple a lot of these companies the technology space is going into this space for business reasons obviously and so how, how do you find your values of integrating with the tech technology company values uh, maybe you can give us some feedback on that i think a lot of our students obviously want to work 
at places like Google and, and, and big brands. Um, but um, of course, some question remains as to how, do, how does your personal values, uh, how do they fit in to this tech culture, one might say? Yeah, so it was a really, really important question for me um, in making a decision to leave the not-for-profit world on the provider side and go to a tech company, which I had no experience with, the for-profit world, which I had no experience with. And um, other than like you and everyone else, a consumer and what you read and, you know, these tech companies are, um, well, there's a tech backlash and are they, you know, creepy and doing bad stuff and all that. So it was really, really important for me to understand it. Mm -hmm. um, but you really never understand it until you're in it. So I checked the boxes in my brain about, okay, it seems okay, it seems okay, and, and I made the decision. But now I've been here a year and nine months. Um, it's a perfect fit for my values. Uh, the, actually, um, maybe it's even better than me. Maybe it's made me even better. So it's an interesting, and let me give you kind of some examples. So um, the first 90 days I'm at Google, I'm meeting with all these teams from these different groups who've come together, groups of 12 or 15 people, and they're telling me about their projects. And um, it was like the best film festival I've ever been to. Like, I just loved it, right? And at the end of a lot of the meetings, I would ask some questions about commercializing it. Like, this is an amazing product. Like, have we thought about, you know, how to make money? And I even use the word money. And the 12 people would like lean down the conference table and look down at me like I said something wrong. Like I didn't even get it. And the message was we didn't come here to make money to this part of Google. We came here to make a bunch of people healthier. Like you, you're saying a bad word. And it kind of surprised me. I was like, whoa, um, Google really believes in, it goes back to kind of our founder's letter of helping people. And if you help people, um, and this was definitely my mantra before Google, I used to say, let's take care of patients and everything else will take care of itself, including the finances. Um, that's how Google rolls. Um, so the message I have in leading this um, group at Google that focuses on health is go make a bunch of people healthier and then we'll figure out the business model. So there's no real pressure up front to at all um, sacrifice who I am at all. This is about making people healthier. Now, I keep saying to the team, I had to reframe that money question, that the healthcare industry is somewhat skeptical of the tech industry because we have these fits and starts. And if we're going to win over the healthcare industry, not only do we have great products, we have to show financial stability because that will then decrease their anxiety that Google's going to quit or not do it, et cetera. So I keep saying we need financial stability to, to, for those in the market to believe in us, right? So I've, I've reframed it because I don't want to be at the whims of uh, I want to be able to be responsible, keep investing in the business, making sure that we can uh, bring in the right people and develop the right things. So uh, we got to be sustainable, ultimately. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing that. So sort of the big question that everyone has is COVID-19. And it's, it has brought such a huge impact to, to all of our lives that in some sense, we're all hoping to go back to the life uh, that we had before COVID-19. Um, and I thought, you know, who better to ask than you to comment on what are some efforts that um, 
Google is doing perhaps in, in COVID-19 and maybe just more generally in more broadly speaking, how COVID-19 has perhaps changed or shifted in your thinking uh, as to or accelerated uh, uh, towards a certain direction that do you might have some comments on. So I'm, I'm leaving it kind of broad here for you to generally tackle the topic of COVID-19 and, and your perspective, Google's perspective and the direction. So. Sure. So um, back to your earlier questions about kind of how I got to Google and what this new area is in Google. Um, and I hinted at COVID was good for us. Um, COVID was good for us because all of a sudden we saw on, and I, and I say that with incredible um, respect for how bad this pandemic is, um, but it was good because we started to see so many people uh, uh, um, coming to us asking for information. And we have this opportunity to make sure that the millions and billions of people that depend on Google products every day got information that was authoritative and helping them with this pandemic. Um, very early on, um, Google search page created an SOS page. This was the first time in the history of Google that we did an SOS page for a medical condition. Uh, basically, an SOS page had been done in the past for like natural disasters like floods. And it's when we take over the page and when you search, we bring you to a page that has no advertisements, that just has authoritative information, and it's um, customized to your region. So you have local, national, and international based on where you are. We did it for COVID. Um, and really, really proud of my team, especially my clinical folks that work with our team on search to get that authoritative information out. We also did it with YouTube. Um, if you look for a YouTube video on COVID, that team has done an amazing job of raising up the good information, removing um, the dangerous information, uh, and making sure that um, the iffy information is really pushed down. Um, uh, the part of that was a COVID information page that has had 300 billion views. And that number just blows me away, right? And so when we think of the impressions that we can get that kind of authoritative information out, it's fantastic. But this has all been through partnership with whether it's the World Health Organization, the National Alliance for Mentally Ill. We saw a lot of uh, questions around depression and anxiety around the CDC. It's really been getting that information out and making sure it's accessible. We also put out early community mobility reports, which um, I just saw some uh, tweets about them recently, but it's, this is, you know, in your county, again, privacy preserving, not a, at an individual level, are people not going to work, staying away from the park, going to the park, going to the store, and using that data so public health people could make decisions about, um, early on, you know, how much to lock down or not lock down. Just recently um, launched symptom search so that researchers can see are people in this location looking more for uh, searches around I can't smell and is that a predictor that COVID's going to peak in that area. We have launched a bunch of information around COVID searches in general. Um, I mean, COVID information in general, so people can understand uh, and researchers and public health folks can see what's going on. And then super proud of our partnership with um, uh, Apple around uh, exposure notification. So for public health agencies, uh, and it's really starting to take off in the US, it had previously uh, been picked up pretty big in Europe and other parts of the world, where when you think about it, if um, I'm positive, for COVID and I go to my doctor, I can tell them the people that I live with and who I've come in contact with if I was going to work, um, but I might not be able to tell them, or I certainly would be able to tell them the people that I just sat next to on the bus, right? Because I don't know who they are. So this tool, again, on Android or on an Apple phone, 
allows public health to use it such that that person that I sat next to on the bus, now that I'm positive if that person volunteered and downloaded this, um, could now be notified they were within six feet of somebody for over 15 minutes um, that is now positive. Again, Google and Apple don't have any of the medical records. We don't have the people's names. It's all encrypted and kind of uh, high tech from that standpoint. But what an amazing tool as we try to kind of continue to build this out. Um, uh, we've worked on uh, um, uh, specific things around mental health that I'm proud of. Um, we saw a big increase in depression and anxiety. We launched an anxiety screener. Uh, of course, we have a COVID screener. Uh, we've updated our depression screener. We have a post-traumatic stress disorder screener. These are tools that people can go to google.com and in a privacy preserving way, do a self-assessment. You know, a lot of people with anxiety keep it private so they can, they can, or don't even tell their doctor or their friend or their spouse. They can go to Google, see where they are in that spectrum, and then we can lead them down the path of here's how you get treated at the VA. Here's an online therapy that's available for you. So we can close the gap between how long you're suffering to when you actually start getting help. Um, we launched a lot of tools to help doctors and hospitals do virtual care. Um, we've helped on maps so people know if you're going to go to this urgent care, um, they're doing COVID testing and they want you to call in advance. So those same kind of things that we would do about you know, those, you know, about is the pizza parlor open? We've done those same kind of tools to help people understand an urgent care, for example. So a lot of work around COVID. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I want to bring up a couple of project uh, questions based on um, a couple of your comments, if, if I may. Um, one question that was brought to, to us from one of the students is, uh, what are some methods that Google is doing to build trust with healthcare providers. You mentioned financial stability is one, um, but maybe there are other methods or factors that that um, you're taking to build more trust with healthcare providers. And I'm assuming what the student is talking about is, is probably privacy around uh, data and health healthcare records, right? So, um, or, or anything else that, how do you build that trust perhaps? Um, Maybe if you can comment on that. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely love the question. I think it's um, um, the number one question that we need to answer. I now having been here a year and a half, the technology is world class. I'm positive it can save lives, positive. If we don't have trust on the healthcare side, the tools will stay on the shelf and we'll have missed the opportunity. So how are we doing it? I, I think um, the beginning is um, by demonstrating we're serious. Uh, and the way you demonstrate seriousness in the world of healthcare to start with is by um, evidence-based research. So we have a huge research team that's published in top tier journals, um, basically saying, here are our tools and they work. So let me give a couple examples. Um, uh, we have a team in London that has a um, app that allows nurses and doctors over there to get notified <clears throat> if a patient's kidney function in the hospital is going in the wrong direction. Creatinine is a measure of kidney function. So you get an alert that the patient in room six has an increase in creatinine. Just by doing that, just having that app, um, we took the time from diagnosis of acute kidney injury from in those hospitals was taking four hours. It got down to 14 minutes. There was a 30% decrease in the cost, I'm sorry, a 17% decrease in the cost of care and 30% less patients had cardiac arrest if the team had that uh, tool. We published that. We then took that information and said, well, that's just looking at creatinine. What if we actually looked and used our tools, our artificial intelligence and machine learning, and looked at 600,000 variables per patient in real time? We did this in partnership research with the VA here. 
And um, for those 70,000 patients, we showed that the time for diagnosis went not only from four hours to 14 minutes, it went to negative two days. So our tool, 48 hours before a patient had any sign of clinical deterioration, could predict with 90% accuracy that that patient would end up on dialysis. So we demonstrated what I would call anticipatory medicine, published that. Um, we just recently published our tool around reading, you know, dermatology skin issues. If you go to a dermatologist, they usually get the skin disorder right about 90% of the time. If you go to a primary care doctor, they get your rash right about 50% of the time. Rashes are kind of hard if you're not a specialist. When those primary care doctors or nurse practitioners used our artificial intelligence to look at the rash and help them, their accuracy got to 90%. So they became as good as dermatology, which is great because in a lot of places, there's a long wait for dermatology. Or in rural America, there is no dermal, uh, there isn't a lot of dermatologists. So just published that, it was the cover of Nature. Um, we have a whole group of um, uh, a foundation that Google is serious about healthcare, right? These are peer reviewed published articles. The next phase I think is, um, has been really bringing in a clinical voice into the team. So uh, my team is made up of amazing engineers and user experience people and product people and a lot of doctors and nurses and pharmacists that are there kind of building the tools with us. Um, we, we lean on the outside industry to help us and bring them in to help us make those decisions. Um, we have, uh, and I don't think this is even good enough, we follow all the rules on how you handle health information um, to make sure that we follow what's HIPAA, which is the rule in the US, around how you handle private information, meaning it can only be used for what you are um, uh, been asked to do it, to use it for, how you do the training, how you measure that. I think we need even a higher level of um, uh, um, clarity about how we use um, information to help people. But, but, but when it gets down to the trust piece, um, to make it simpler, to me, for whatever piece of information Google needs to do our thing, we have to give back a disproportionate amount of value. So when you think about it, when you use Google Maps to decide to go from Pepperdine to Santa Monica, um, you're giving Google a lot of information. You're telling them it's you, you're telling them when you're leaving, and you're telling them where you're going. And in exchange, Google tells you turn, light, turn left in a thousand feet, right? You get value along the way, and in the, in the end, you've made a decision that it's worth it. We need to do the same in health. Any piece of information we get, we have to give you on your health journey more and more value such that you say, oh, I get it. I get that Google um, needed my information to help me get through this. They helped me so much that it was worth that. And that's whether it's on the consumer side or on the clinical side. And so we spent a lot of time um, thinking about this uh, thinking about the ethics of what we're doing. We have an ethics committee bringing in outside folks, being transparent. we got to get this trust right. Uh, that's a great question. All right, thank you. Um, just one quick question related to that would be, um, you know, you just talked about that decision-making a person does in using Google Map. Um, I think, I guess the original question that uh, people had regarding this was they, the information that they give for for their for health records or health reasons, that data, uh, that decision did not include, let's say, a, a company or healthcare system or or somebody else making a decision to let's say use that data for other purposes that the original person did not intend to make that decision on, right? So um, this is kind of the big issue, I guess, with with most tech companies, whether it's Facebook or most of these other companies. So I think in terms of that decision transaction that you were talking about, I guess that's where the, the focus would be. Am I correct in, in making sure that 
the decision that a person is making with Google Health is remains that way and, and not go beyond that. Not only is that correct, that's the law. So, so if we get any health information, um, we're only allowed to use it if, if, if a hospital brings us in and says, help us organize the health record using the tools that you have uh, figured out around organizing information. Um, the only thing that we can do is help the hospital organize the health information, period. So we can't use it to train our models. We can't use it to build new models. We can't use it and don't to combine it with any other information on that person. You, like everyone else, when you go to the doctor, they may have used um, an outside agency to help with laboratory or help with billing. Those vendors can only do laboratory and billing. They can't use it to do anything else. We follow that exact same um, principle because it's the law, it's the right thing to do. Um, so when we're brought in, we're brought in under those exact same um, uh, uh, components. And um, I think it's absolutely crucial to, to maintain the trust. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. So this is sort of the last question that I have for you to comment on, which is essentially about the future. So um, what, Two, in two ways. One is sort of future of health and future of how you see uh, this shaping out, out with, with Google and also future for our students. Having been through these MBA programs, um, you know, what I've heard is even medical research is all becoming computer, computer research or AI research now. Um, maybe even businesses are becoming computer research and AI research as well. So maybe two comments from, from you, which is one, the future of health in your perspective and sort of advice to our students as to the future of uh, a business school students and, and what are some of the, the main points that you, you would like to wish upon our students to learn while they're here? Okay, so if, if um, maybe we talk way too much about technology because um, I, I hope that's not the future. Um, of everything. Healthcare, if I answer that one first, mm -hmm. the fundamental underpinning of healthcare is people taking care of people. Whether that's a mom or dad providing care at home for an elderly parent, for one another, for a child, whether that's people going into the formalized healthcare system and going to a doctor or a hospital or a clinic, it's people caring for people. The tools and the technology, like the stethoscope, improve ability to provide that kind of care. Um, feeling a child's forehead and that they're hot um, is really helpful to understand the physiology, but ultimately it's about the care. And so um, to me, we don't want to lose sight of that. The future, I hope, of healthcare um, is more about care. I hope and that our tools, um, while they're amazing from a technological standpoint, we're having this discussion this morning, I want our tools to allow doctors and nurses to spend more time at the bedside and less time looking for information in a computer so that they can heal, right? I want our tools to be such that you almost see a hospitalization as a failure of outpatient care. Outpatient care is a failure of home care and home care is a failure of caring for a community. So if we can tell communities how to stay healthy, they can spend less time in the care system, but that's caring, right? <laughs> So that to me is the future of healthcare. And when you get to that future, when you talk about communities, you get much, you get really quickly to, do people have places to sleep? Do they have nutritious food? Um, is there purpose in their life? Um, are they ability, are they living under chronic stress, right? Those are the things that drive health outcomes. 
And so to me, that's the future of health and healthcare. I don't want our tools to become the future. I want our tools to help facilitate that future. And then from a business standpoint, um, healthcare, like a lot of other industries, is going through a lot of transitions. So we need a lot of smart people to help us. Uh, I think the future for MBA students is really, really bright if each one of you finds something that you're passionate about so that it doesn't feel like work. Um, each one of you finds something that you're passionate about that makes this world or your community better. Um, I'd love you all to go into healthcare. Um, uh, so to me, it's about that same kind of sense of purpose, that passion, um, and the tools are great, but kind of going back to my Pepperdine experience, the biggest lesson was to be present, that I didn't have to go look for anything, it was right in front of me. I just didn't know what I was doing and the tools helped me do it better. Um, so to me, that does it, that hopefully is timeless. That, 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 that is as important as it was to me, whatever, 27 years ago, as it is tomorrow and in 20 years later. Well, Dr. Feinberg, this has been such an amazing and inspiring conversation together with all of our students. Um, especially, I think, in terms of brand, I think based on our conversation today, you're making Pepperdine proud. Uh, you know, I'm so proud of you and, and all of us as well that they're, you're doing this uh, for us and for, for, for the community and also for, or for our students taking your time to spend uh, this, this valuable time and your insights and, and experience with us. And we look forward to help hosting you again in the future. Um, and uh, it's been such a wonderful time. And I just wanna say thank you so much for, for this session. So all of you students out there, if you're not clapping, it's time to give uh, Dr. Feinberg our Pepperdine wave and just say thank you. And thank you for this time. We look yeah. forward to communicating with you again. So, and I'll leave it with your final comments before we log off, so thank you. Yeah, I think the only request I have is the next time we do it in Malibu. Of course, of yeah. course, yes. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David. Sure. Okay, bye-bye. Uh, Take care. Mm -hmm. Bye, bye everyone.